this week on The Travel Show. We've got the struggle of equality being queer, and we've got the struggle of equality being Indigenous people in this country. How pride reaches the world's oldest cultures. Things like this make me happy because it's ensuring that things are changing. How to see the world without being able to hear it. You'll see the smell is close, but then the lens in the mouth is different. And a teetotal tipple in the land of wine. It's good actually. I don't like it. Hello there from sunny Paris, where later on in the show, I'll be finding out whether the City of Love is ready to relinquish its favourite drink. But first... We're off to Sydney, which is celebrating 50 years since its first gay pride week. And five since same-sex couples were given the same marriage rights as everyone else. So that's made this year's pride events all the more special as Jackie Wakefield's been finding out. The summer season in Sydney, and everyone's out on the streets. It's the time of year the parks and open spaces are full of parades, parties and concerts. And this year, after the quiet of Australia's long lockdown, nobody needs much excuse to head outside to reconnect with their friends. Most cities have a pride celebration. They've become a regular fixture in the calendar, but this year in Sydney, we've got a special edition. World Pride is in town. World Pride is kind of a touring jamboree held in a different place every other year. And for some, Sydney is the perfect host. It's gonna be the queerest, biggest celebration of Pride we have ever experienced in Australia. You think Mardi Gras is big? This is Mardi Gras on steroids. It's so free. Yeah. yeah, like I've only been in Sydney for a couple of years. I came from Tasmania, so Sydney's pretty awesome. It's just nice to see everyone out and about sort of celebrating, even friends that aren't in the community, just everyone gets together for it. 45 years ago, we call our 78ers. In 1978, a group of people marched on the streets and protested for equality. A lot of people were brutally attacked, a lot of people put in jail, and from then was really the start of our um, first public pride movement in 1978, which is our, now turned into our Sydney Gay Lesbian Mardi Gras Parade. This is the first time that a World Pride is taking place in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. So I say to people, we won it on three things. <laughs> um, we, run it, we run it on our First Nations visibility and inclusion and culture, because we are the oldest surviving culture on the planet. We won it on the advocacy of our 78ers and our Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. And we also won it because of um, our uh, relationship with the Asia Pacific region. In previous years, it's been held in New York and Copenhagen. This is the first time it's come to the Southern Hemisphere and that allows the spotlight to be shone on people from the oldest known surviving culture on Earth. Welcome each and every one of you unto my Gadigal people's custodial land. Normally this place is an art centre. But during World Pride, it's where Australia's First Nations LGBT communities have been coming. And for the duration, they've renamed it Murray Mudung Butbut, -but, or The Gathering Space. Chocolate Box grew up in a small town in New South Wales and is now a drag act in demand. In fact, she won the Miss First Nations competition in 2019 and 2020 and is competing again this year for the title of Supreme Queen. I fell into drag because I was working as a bartender at a gay venue and saw a drag and I was like, that looks fun and it looks like a good way I can continue my dance career and like live out my dream basically. And did it, fell in love with it, 
got asked to do a show, got asked to come back, and here we are eight and a half years later. It's my job. <laughs> it's fabulous. Your cultural background, how does that come into your performance? How does that influence you? The way we tell stories, we tell, that's how we communicate, that's how we pass on our, there's no real like family heirlooms, there's no material things. We tell stories, we pass stories down from generation to generation and that's what we're doing on stage. Every time we get out there, we're telling a story, we're painting a picture for the audience to imagine. We all need, everyone just needs to communicate more, really. It would make the world much easier. <laughs>
derritiendo, se fríe, se funde bien, ya queda bien doradito y ese le echa encima a todos los tacos, a los que les gusta con cochinada, que ahora todos quieren con cochinada. Esta es la cochinada. Ahorita que se está friendo mucha carne, antes se fría, pues aquí se fría mucha carne y este, como no, no sabíamos qué hacer con el jugo de la carne y todo lo que se juntaba, este, empezó a juntarse mucha, mucho jugo. Entonces empezamos a darles a probar a la clientela por taco uno por uno así para que lo probaran a ver si les gustaba. Y pues ya empezó a gustarles así la, el asientito que es la cochinada. Y le pusieron muchos nombres, le, ponían, le pusieron basura, carbón, shishi, mugre, cochinada, bueno, porquería, un montón de nombres. Pero lo que más les gustó fue la cochinada y así se quedó. Otros con nuestro sazón, pues casi más bien todo, hasta los niños de dos años ya comen tacos de bisté. Pastor con cochi, ponemos un cochi. Pues es muy bueno para nosotros porque vamos este, preparando una clientela que viene este, precediendo a las siguientes generaciones y ahorita ya vamos con la tercera generación de, de clientes. Still to come on the travel show. See the world without being able to hear it. And why France is saying no to a booze-free future. Not my case. I like wine, regular wine, I'm used to that. So don't go away. A trip down memory lane next, and one from our series of encounters with travellers who experience the world very differently. Now the prospect of heading off for a life on the road while deaf may sound daunting to many of us, but for one woman, it's opened doors and sparked new friendships. And we met her back in 2019.
end this week, we're back in the French capital and taking some time out for a little tipple. Whether you're mad for Merlot or salivate over a Sauvignon Blanc, the city of love swoons for a glass of wine. As other countries have music or fashion, France, you'll see a glass of wine on each table in any bistro, Michelin star restaurant. I mean, there are paintings about wine. They fought wars about wine. So it's worth 25 billion euro a year to the French economy, and then there were five and a half billion bottles produced in France last year. But as bars and restaurants all over the world shut their doors, the pandemic forced loads of us to reassess our relationship with booze and explore more non-alcoholic alternatives. International sales of non-alcoholic drinks have shot up by a quarter, but in France, the growth has been slower. Reportedly just 4% in the same period. So how do Parisians feel about alcohol-free wine? I've never tried it. I like wine, regular wine, I'm used to that. I think we're losing something. You want to feel the taste. It's not as fun either. One man hoping to transform French attitudes is Augustine. Hello, Hadi. Last Bonjour. year, he set up what he says is Paris's first shop entirely devoted to non-alcoholic drinks. Do you get any snobbery? Do you get people who come in and, and when they hear there's no alcohol, they're like, what, what is this? Uh, yeah, at the beginning, some people were kind of uh, making fun or like, just laughing when they enter. But then for us, it's not against alcohol because most of our customers, they are what we call flexi drinkers. So they keep drinking alcohol, but they also time to time want to have a break. Of course, you have all the pregnant women, the Muslim people who never drink alcohol. Actually, it came from my own story because I quit drinking during the pandemic. I don't like soda, I don't like very sweet beverages, so I was looking for other options. He's far from the first person to ride this trend. A few rounds of alcohol-free bars have opened up over the past few years all across the world. From 0% Tokyo to Sands Bar in Texas to the Virgin Mary in Dublin. Along with spirits and beers, Augustin stocks two kinds of alcohol-free wine. The first is the alcoholized. It's fermented like a traditional wine before the alcohol is then removed. You'll see the smell is close, but then the lens in the mouth is different. You know what, that is so interesting. So I can taste the kind of familiarity and then I'm waiting for the alcohol, but it hasn't arrived. It's like wine light. The second kind doesn't involve fermentation and is more like a posh juice. And this one is very good if you eat it with your meat or pasta. We've picked a particularly potent one made from beetroot. It's busy. I don't think I'm ready for this one yet. But this is exactly what we see with our customers. So now they are more, more looking into uh, substitutes, so beer or de-alcoholized wine. And we know in some years they may look more for new recipes and new techniques and everything. But are Parisians ready to embrace this new gastronomic experience? There's only one way for me to find out. Excusez-moi, excusez-moi, s'il vous plaît. Would you like to try some non-alcoholic wine? It's good actually. I like it. I don't like it. I don't think it tastes like wine. No, it, it's, it's sweeter, I think. Oh, it's actually good. You like it? Yes. Wow. That's the de-alcoholized wine. Now for the beetroot. Not my case. It's more, uh, more acidic. More acidic. Yes. More acidic. It's, um, this one is better than <laughs> And whether they like the wines or not, most of the Parisians we spoke to were at least open to alcohol-free alternatives. Yes, because I, I'm not fond of uh, alcohol. I prefer the taste. So for you, it's just finding something that has the right taste. Yes. And then it'll be a winner. Yeah.
I'm not sure if the people of Paris are quite ready to give up traditional wine just yet. But the idea of being able to have a couple of glasses without having a hangover the next day, I think is pretty cool. Well, that's your lot for this week. Coming up next time... Rajans in the Spanish city of Malaga, as it marks 50 years since the death of its most famous son, the artist Pablo Picasso. You can see the influence of the city on his art. It's very diverse and there's a lot going on. And we're in Glasgow to reveal the hidden story behind the UK's real national dish, which isn't fish and chips, in case you were wondering. Have you ever told anyone outside of the restaurant what's inside? No. Until then, you know how it works. You can find us on BBC iPlayer as well as on social media too. We're in all the usual places, along with lots of other great travel content from around the BBC. See you soon. Bye-bye.